Hebrews 13. We'll go through the whole chapter, I trust, and then we'll move on to something else next time as we've graduated beyond Hebrews for now. Hebrews 13.1 says, Let brotherly love continue. Let brotherly love continue. In this chapter, we'll see the parting words from Paul, I believe, is the author. I think it's pretty clear he's the author, but it doesn't say explicitly. But these are Paul's parting words to his Jewish audience. He gives them things to remember. First one is to remember brotherly love. And he's not talking about blood relatives here. It's quite clear. Christians are called to love their spiritual family. We know this. Spiritual family. I'm not going to go a lot of places, but maybe just to start out, I'd like to show you those words of Christ again in Matthew chapter 12. To think about brothers and sisters in the Lord. Look at Matthew 12, please. I think it's a, it's a thought that's too often forgotten or neglected. The fact that when you are born again, you join a different family. This is not to slight your blood relatives, but absolutely your brothers and sisters in the Lord should take precedence in your life. Right? It's true. There's no way to argue with it in Scripture. I love all my siblings I grew up with. Uh, eight of them. I love every one of them. But I have a lot of love and biblical love for my spiritual family that I've met over time. Look at Matthew 12, 47. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? Remember, Jesus' earthly family wants to see him. And this is his response. Who is my mother? Who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Jesus Christ gives us the principle of your Christian family being your true family. Right? I know cults can take this principle and abuse it and all whatever dark cult history you can look up. But there's a true principle that when you're saved, your, your commonality with your Christian brother grows so much greater than your commonality with your blood brother who may not be a Christian, right? Sure, growing up with your brother in blood, you, you had all kinds of things in common. You played, you lived the same place, had the same friends. When you get saved, all of a sudden you'll start noticing you might not have the same commonalities. You might have completely goal, different goals in life, right? Completely different outlooks. Completely different master and father and God. So it behooves us to not only learn to view our blood relatives as not the end-all be-all. That's important for us. That's part of the world that we're supposed to let go. That's part of the world that we're not supposed to be turning back again and again to that world. That is. But then on the other side, Christians should be longing to find that brotherhood, that Christian family. They should be. And therein is why God establishes New Testament local churches throughout our world. You go, you find what family, that local assembly you're supposed to be a part of. And then when you're there, you let brotherly love continue. And brotherly love abound you soon find that those doing the will of the Father which is in heaven are the people you want to be around anyway. Those are the people you want your kids around, right? Inside our families on this earth, there's all kinds of mixed company. I'll be going to a family gathering this week, and I'm looking forward to it. It'll be fine, but it will be all kinds of mixed company. I don't know what relative such and such is going to say in front of my kids. It's going to be hard. I want to protect them, right? So it's not going to be really a time of relaxing around them. It's a part of the world. But whereas if I meet with church friends, you know, have company over or come to church, I can relax knowing that we have the same father, right? Play with the same rules. I ask everybody, or everyone should be seeking out this brotherly company. Christians. Go back to Hebrews 12, you, or Hebrews 13, excuse me. Hebrews 13. It's hard to let brotherly love continue if you haven't found your brethren and your sisters whom you're supposed to be fellowshipping with. 
Many a Christian today, I think COVID did a number on that. COVID did that number of, well, now we can just consume Christianity from the confines of our homes and couches because it's the same thing to watch a YouTube service. It's not. There ain't no fellowshipping going on YouTube service. I don't care if the guy's an amazing preacher. The church isn't just preaching, right? The church is the interaction of the saints gathered together. It's an absolute part of the local church. And preaching is just one, one part of it all. Look at 13 verse 2. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. It says in verse 1, remember brotherly love. In verse 2, remember hospitality. It's referencing, or it certainly looks like it's referencing characters like Abraham, right? Entertaining the angels that visited. But I think here, I think there's application for us. It could also be speaking of when it mentions entertaining angels. I think it could certainly mean being hospitable to God's servants. You see Rahab did that with the spies, right? You see um, the woman with the prophet um, making the prophet's quarters. You see hospitality. I think we can take a principle here that if you find somebody who is serving God, I think you should be hospitable toward them, right? Look at verse 3. Help them is another word to say it. 3. Help them. 3 says, Remember them that are in bonds is bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves also in the body. Remember, it says here, remember and pray for those who may have it worse than you have it. Remembering those who may have it worse, whether it be in a different country or a different time period. Um, of course, you can't really pray for them now. It's done, but... Remember people who have had things worse than you. It'll help your outlook in life. Like, we haven't been thrown into prison yet. We may get little persecution here and there, but other people are getting real. In Canada, people were getting thrown into prison over holding services, right? I always complain about the fact that they tried to shut us down during the COVID mess, but we didn't get shut down, and they didn't do anything about it. So that's America. <laughs> they say you're not allowed to, but you do it anyways. In Canada, said you're not allowed to, and if you did it, you got in trouble. Yeah. We should remember those people who take stands in harder places like your communist China or wherever it may be. Ukraine wouldn't be a very nice place to serve either right now. Look at verse 4. Marriage is honorable and all in the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. In this list of things to remember, the writer throws in this idea about remember what marriage is in the, the sign-off of his important letter. I think our world today could do well to remember what marriage is. Marriage is honorable and all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers, as people who have relations outside of marriage, and adulterers, as people who have relations inside marriage, God will judge. There's reason to be strong on the topic of divorce, remarriage, and, and saving yourself from marriage, because God's judgment comes to those who disobey. It's the simple truth. Look at verse 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. We, as Christians, are to remember to not be covetous. And it ties right in that last line. It says, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. 6 says, Remember to trust God for your needs, right? Some parts of covetousness are we can enjoy things, but also part of covetousness is because we're trusting in those things, right? We have to have more money, have to have more stuff, because that's how we're going to make it by. I might actually be preaching a little bit on that tonight. I hope you'll, uh, if you're able to make it out. But the, the key is, I will never leave thee more, nor forsake thee. We have God. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember to trust God for your needs. Look at 7. Remember them that which have the rule over you, who have spoken to you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Remember them that have the rule over you. We'll touch on that in a minute. This first reference to them that have the rule over you. I, I like someone that says, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. I think you should remember that as you view leaders, church leaders, people have impacted you. You may not like everything that they've done, but what's the total outcome of their ministry, right? Are people getting saved? Are houses um, being ordered and, and things of the Lord? That's like a big picture thought there, isn't it? I don't think you're ever going to waltz into a church and like every single aspect, right, of a, a church leader. I don't think it's going to happen. 
Oh, it's my cup of tea in every area. Just perfect. I don't think it's going to happen. But as you view church and you view where does God want you in your life, I think you're supposed to say, well, what's the total picture, right? What is the church doing? Is the church good for kids? Bad for kids. Good for souls? Bad for souls. Good for the community? Bad for the community. And you take it in whole. I'm not saying then you, you throw sound doctrine out of the window. I'm saying once you find churches with sound doctrine, don't be too picky after that, right? We can make that mistake, and, and really what it leads to is people staying home. I know many, 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 many people, many people who are home today because they just cannot find the perfect church. And I still think you need to go, and that means you need to move, it means you start a church somehow, then do it. But just staying away from the fellowship of the saints and where you'll find the brotherly love is not a biblical option. Look at verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Verse 8 tells us to remember Christ. And remember that He never changes, which is a good thought because that means His Word never changes. His promises never change. Right? We can take this Bible and understand it. That is not any different today. Principles we see here are meant to be applied to our lives. Verse 9, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, right? Which happens when you think that this Bible has changed over time and there's no absolute truth on the page. We can't take it literally. What you'll do your whole life is dance around from doctrine to doctrine, not believing this book is a, is a rock that doesn't fade away. For it is a good thing that the whole heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Verse 9, I think, tells us to remember sound doctrine. Find it, remember it, hold it. Don't be tossed to and fro. Be established. There's good reason to learn doctrine like a Sunday school class. There's good reason. Not only is it good for you to be able to give an answer to other men, sound doctrine produces stability in our lives, right? Then when you see someone say something crazy, it doesn't throw you for a loop. Wait, is this right or is this wrong? Wait, I thought this was the truth the whole time, and now this guy says it's not. You're going to find a lot of people who challenge biblical beliefs over, the, over your years. A lot of people are going to challenge everything you think you believe in here. So that behooves you then to take these doctrines and solidify them in your mind. Study it out. You're not sure on a topic? Well, get more comfortable on it. What the devil likes to do is he finds people where they're confused, they're not sure of something. He'll find that and he'll exploit it. Here, you know, this topic, here I'll throw you something completely confusing and get you all shook up. Christians, growth in the Lord, a lot of growth is to try to be more stable than what the scriptures say. And stability comes from studying God's word. The church can help with that. Look at, uh, from verse 10 to 12, there's uh, another little lesson here. Look at 10, it says, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. Remember, we alluded to this passage early in our, in our study here in Hebrews. This idea about the sacrifices being burned outside the camp. What did it mean? Why did they do it? Well, like everything in the Old Testament, it was to teach us something. Let me read you a verse in Leviticus 4.12. If you want to study this, you can see it in Exodus 29. You can see it in Leviticus 4. But let me, I'll read you Leviticus 4.12. It says, Even the whole bullock shall he carry forth without the camp into a clean place, where the ashes are poured out, and burn him on the wood with fire. That was the sin offering this bullock, they would take this offering and they wouldn't do it in the tabernacle there, right? Or in the courtyard. They would take this bullock and go outside the camp. The metaphor, the lesson that we can learn, the sin offering was outside the camp. That is to say, outside of Judaism. I believe it was absolutely pointing toward Christ even in that demonstration, right? That the solution, the sin offering, would not come from within the camp of Israel, within uh, Judaism. Christ then, it says in verse 12, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. The suffering of Jesus Christ was made outside of Judaism, right? 
He didn't come and all he, all he did was argue with the Pharisees and the Jews ended up um, being the ones to send him off to his death, betraying him. Jesus was outside the camp and he's the perfect sin offering, right? There is a lot of wonderful typology as you read through Exodus, Leviticus. And that's, how, that's what you should be searching for. It's, it's good to understand the history of the Jewish people and God's rules for the Jewish people. But even broader than that, as a New Testament saint, we're saying, why did he do that and what is it supposed to teach us? What's the parallel? Like, what did the Sabbath mean? What was it supposed to teach us? That's what I believe the outside the camp meant. The solution, the sin offering, is not in Judaism. And we should tell our Jewish friends that. Look at verse 13. Then it parallels to our life. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Our charge we can take to mean that we are going to have to go forth outside of Judaism as well, or outside of any mainstream belief that undermines Jesus Christ as the Savior, right? We're going to have to go outside of that. Well, there's a lot of mainstream belief that undermines Christ as the Savior. Catholicism is a big part of that mainstream belief that is completely contrary to Jesus Christ being the way, the truth, and the life. But there are others now. There are many mainstream beliefs that even question sin in the first place, why we should have a sin offering. Those are mainstream beliefs that we go without the camp bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city. I commented on that last week. Look at verse uh, 15, please. We're getting through it all because I want to spend a little bit of time um, on, a on a topic here toward the end. Look at verse 15, please. Uh, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Again, returning to the list of things we should remember to do, the author here says we should remember to give thanks. Remember to give thanks. That's something we're going to be preaching on homes today in our main service. Homes should remember to give thanks. It's something where it's helpful when a mother or a father or a child can remind each other to give thanks. I'm not just talking about just for the tacos. I'm talking about like for everything. Tacos too. Look at verse 16. And we'll, we'll look at, I'm sorry, look at the words. The praise of God continually. Let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. We don't have to go outside and slay your cow and do an, a sacrifice. The sacrifice we, that God says for New Testament saints, is simply to lift up your name and pray, lift up your voice and praise the Lord. Thank him for it. Let people know that you're grateful to your almighty God. Look at 16. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Again, it says forget not. This idea of remembering to do good and to communicate. Communicate is an old-fashioned word for give. Yeah, it means, means to give. To do good and to give, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. So again, Christians aren't called to slay animals, but some sacrifices we do is good. We help one another and we give to one another. Look at 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for it is unprofitable for you. We'll come back to this. Please look at 18. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. But I beseech you the rather to do this, that I may be restored to you the sooner. The author here says, pray for us, right, that, we're, that we have a good conscience and they live honestly, but especially, or rather, pray for us that we'll be restored unto you. I believe we'll be able to see him again soon. I, re I remember here that we should remember to pray for one another, right? That's, those are a couple things we could be praying for. Pray for us that we, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things. Pray for people that they have a good conscience, that they're living a holy life, where their conscience isn't eating at them because they're living wrong. In all things, willing to live honestly. Then you can pray for other things like being able to be, again, be together again with a brother or sister. In verse 19. Remember to pray for one another. Sometimes we forget, don't we? Prayer life. Um, zero prayer life is the bottom of the mature Christian scale. 
zero prayer life, right? A developing prayer life is when you begin to start praying for yourself and your actions, right? It's just great. You're praying for yourself, and the Bible says pray without ceasing. That's great. And I think even another step up is when you've been busy praying for yourself, and now your mind is going to your brothers and sisters. It's needful as well, right? There's power in prayer. How often do we pray for our own lives, let alone the lives of others? We should. We can have families of prayer. It could be a powerful thing to have a family of prayer. I'm trying to teach my kids that. Look at verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Well, we should remember the blood of the everlasting covenant, shouldn't we? The blood of Christ is what saves us. 21, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to him be glory for ever and ever. Amen. I might say we should remember to do God's will. We're praying not just for our livelihood and our outcomes to come to pass, but we're praying that we'll find and do God's will. Right? Not my will be done, but thine. 22, and I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in a few words. Here he asks them to put up with, uh, suffer, and I might say to remember his letter to them, a few words. Friends, we should remember the word of God. Remember the word of God daily. 23. Know ye that are, and by remember, I don't just mean think, oh, a Bible exists. No, I, we mean pick it up, right? 23, know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty with whom if he comes shortly, I will see you. Here's his final words, his salutation. 24, salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. Grace be with you all. Amen. You see in 24, he again alludes to this idea of people having rule over them. He alludes to this idea that there is an authority structure within Christianity. Well, not Judaism. He's been saying that's quite different than Judaism. Within Christianity, there's an authority structure where people have the rule over you. We talked about this in the opening with our children some about order, structure. As a, as a member of a class and your teacher, you submit to your teacher. I want to spend the last 15, 10 minutes on, on this idea about obeying them that have the rule over you. I think our world, our Christian world, has forgotten this idea. And then we look around at our unruly world, our unruly kids, and we wonder, wow, no one can submit out there. But I think Christians ourselves have been guilty of not submitting to the, rules, the rulers over us. Let me introduce this topic with a few verses. It's a tricky subject to talk about when you're a pastor of a church because you look like you're trying to um, do yourself some kind of service. I only want to do God's service and help us understand these scriptures. Look at if, well, let me read to you. It's a short phrase. Actually, I wish you would turn there. Look at, hold a hand here in Hebrews, please, and look at Ephesians 4:11. Ephesians 4:11. My theory is that the disobedience and rebellion we see in our world is not far off from what we see in the church. In fact, I think the disobedience and rebellion you see in the world has a lot to do with the disobedience and rebellion and inability to submit in the church. You wonder why your kids, your grandkids have gone wayward? Well, and I'm talking to myself, could it be something to do with the inability to submit ourselves? Look at Ephesians 4, 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Those first ones, apostles and prophets, we see from Scripture, they've, they've gone away. They've been done away with the completion of Scripture. But we absolutely have, I believe, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And it says, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. God gives these people in these positions for you, for your perfection. For your perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, right? The growth of the body of Christ. These are specific resources God put in the world to help you become more perfect, more Christ-like. That God put in the world to help grow the body of Christ. And I believe spirits to grow the body of Christ, edify. Keep that in mind. 
And now look back at Hebrews. Because I've heard it said way too many times from way too many professing Christians. They'll say, what? Well, I follow Christ. Christ is my great shepherd. As it says in Hebrews 13, 20, right? It does say Jesus Christ is the great shepherd. Absolutely, Jesus Christ is the great shepherd. We have to submit to Christ. But it just so happens in Scripture, it's clear that God gave under shepherds, right? Christ gave shepherds underneath him. That's what the word pastor means. In the 1828 dictionary I looked up, a pastor means a shepherd, one that has care of flocks and herds. And the second definition in this dictionary is a minister of the gospel who has the charge of a church and congregation whose duty is to watch over the people of his charge and instruct them in the doctrines of the Christian religion. That's the old definition of a pastor. The word pastor is very similar to the word bishop. You see that word bishop used in Philippians, 1 Timothy, Titus. A bishop is an over, overseer. We see in Scripture that a, a bishop, a pastor, should be ordained, right, from a pastor before them. You see that in Titus 1.5. It says, For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanton, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. So, pastors don't pop up out of nowhere. They're not supposed to. Although you see some of that today with YouTube ministries and things like that. Pastors are supposed to be the products of an ordained pastor, a group of pastors, and those pastors themselves were ordained by a group of pastors. That's how God's work has been carried out over time. You see that in the pattern of Scripture. That's the biblical model. Pastors ordain pastors. But there are a lot of people who say, I don't give a darn about any of this. Jesus Christ is my great shepherd. He's the one I'm going to follow. And these are the people who never find the flock that they're supposed to be a part of, right? They never plug into the ministry they're supposed to serve at, have the brotherly love they're supposed to experience because they don't understand this principle. So I'm trying to say it today, and I know we've got a lot of the choir here. Maybe we'll post online and someone there will find edification in this idea. I had someone ask me one time, it was a, it was a, a, a brother, I believe, came to church for a long time. Well, not a long time, about a year. And I really liked the guy. But he struggled with the idea of church membership. And I always thought it was interesting because he was quite a... Um, he was quite an athlete in his younger years, and so I'd always challenge him. I was like, well, how many basketball teams were you a part of that you were never a member of? <laughs> it's like, how'd that work out? No, when you join the team, right, you kind of put your name on the page. I'm a part of the team. You show up for the practices. You show up for the games. You can be counted on. You can be depended on, right? I would challenge him with that, with that idea. The world gets this. The world gets membership, right? You join the NRA. You join a political movement. You join Costco for Pete's sake, right? You join things because why? You join things because you're saying, oh, I'm going to abide by these rules, right? I'm going to go into Costco. And I'm going to show my little card and I'm going to get the hot dog and I won't take 17 things off the stand. I don't know if that's a rule or not, but um, you abide by the rules and then you reap the benefits of being a member there, right? Whatever it may be. Sports teams, um, businesses, uh, shopping centers. But when it comes to church, our world today, and Christians, wise Christians say, wait, that's the one thing you don't really need to be a member of. You don't have to be faithful. You just kind of wing it in and out, right? Pop in and out. Maybe you're part of it. Maybe you're not a part of it. Maybe you're part of it. Maybe you're not a part of it. Maybe you're part of it. Some Christians do the whole thing. Well, I'm a part of it. I go here and here and here and here and here sometimes. And then on, on Sunday, on Saturday, I go over here at <laughs> Seventh-day Adventist Church. I go everywhere. Well, let me challenge you. Not you all, I'm sure you don't, I'm sure you understand this point, but let me challenge that idea with, again, with verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls. A big part of this whole concept is that by not understanding that you should have a pastor, you don't get this benefit a pastor watching for your souls, right? Working on, on your perfection and the things of the Lord, your growth and the things of the Lord. You don't get that benefit. I had another man, I'm just telling old stories now, other man came to our church for a long time, and I was, he came, he was very active in church, but he never wanted to join, and he kept, he told me the reason why, he said, well, I just want to watch the church for, you know, six months, I think six months was his number, six months, so, you know what, it's a sad story, but six months passed about, and he ended up leaving, and, and you know what I told him on his way out, I said, um, you know, you know, I, I love you, brother, and I hope you'd fare well in the future. We said those things, nice things. It was cordial. But I said, but truly, I want to let you know you never experienced Truth Baptist Church. 
because you never had a pastor, right? You, you never said, I'm a part of this thing. You never experienced a part of it. I wasn't watching for your soul as a pastor. I didn't know if you were coming or going or staying or what. I didn't know. It was nice you came, but I didn't know. I said, brother, if the you, next time you visit a church, I want to encourage you to do this. Just, I mean, I mean, you can test it out a little while and make sure you're not joining something crazy, right? But then just join because you won't experience a church until you join a church. Church membership is a biblical concept. Your name should be written somewhere on the page. And hey, if it doesn't work out, then take your name off the page and go to some other church. But you won't experience a church until you have a pastor watching for souls. And a pastor doesn't know who to watch for. We get visitors, right? But on Sunday nights, we seem to have random visitors pop in. And I do not believe that they are in my charge. Look, the watcher souls that they must give account. Me as a pastor, I will have to give account for people in my charge. In my flock is an under shepherd. I take that very seriously. But I ask God, God, is this person who I see, you know, every other month or so, are they in my charge? And I believe the answer is an emphatic no. That's a reason to join church. As we, as we wind down, could you think about it like this? I had a, I had a wonderful family devotion telling my kids about this, and my idea was to try to get my kids to be better students in their classes, case okay, so you teachers would be proud of me. I was trying to throw a bone your way. But I was using this passage, verse 17, to teach my kids about being better students for their teachers. Okay, look, members of a class, and now you can think about it in the church realm as well, but members of a class have to, are called to obey, right? Obey them that have the rule of you. Obey means to comply with the commands, orders, or instructions. I said to my kids, you've got to do that in your classes. You've got to obey, right? Comply with what they tell you to do. And then it also says, and submit. A little bit different word. Obey and submit. Similar but different. Submit is to let down. We cover that in our opening exercises. To cause to sink lower. To submit is to yield to authority. To, to say, yeah, you are in charge, right? To wave the flag. I'm here. You're in charge. That's what submitting looks like. I said, in your classes, kids, you've got to do that. You know, Liza, I love you, but you can't take over the class. You've got to say, I, I'm here and the teacher's up here, right? Okay. And then I said, for they watch for your souls. I said, your teacher in class, they have this job to watch for your souls, right? They're looking at your spiritual you, 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 right? And trying to watch out for it and trying to grow and edify souls. That's what a teacher does, someone to rule over you. For teachers, I said, it's a huge responsibility. It says they must give account, right? To be in any position of leadership, whether you're a parent, whether you are a teacher, whether you're a leader in a church or wherever, to have people under you is a great responsibility. It's an honor, but it's a responsibility. It says they watch for your souls. You know what a teacher does in class? A teacher, like in a Sunday school class, is supposed to have like a watchman's kind of view. A watchman, you think about it, is like from a high vantage point, right? Watchman looks down and can see the big picture. How is the class doing? Who's hurting? Who's struggling? Where is danger coming in or coming out? Think about that and then relate that to the church idea. The pastor's view is supposed to be a little bit big picture, right? Where's danger coming in um, to the flock? Where might people be struggling? Where might people be helped to see a bigger picture from a higher vantage point? That's the job of a teacher. And it, it hits home here when I got to the end. My, my, my kids finally started getting why it mattered the most. I said must give account, but then look, down here at the end it says, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. I was trying to tell my kids that you want to have the best class ever, the best teacher ever, well you've got a part in that process, right? People who don't submit, who do not obey, they bring grief on leadership. And who does it end up hurting? Themselves. I was trying to tell the kids, well, what's, what, what's going on if you're causing drama in the class, right? What's going on if you're speaking out of turn? What's going on if you're distracting other students? Well, the class isn't getting as far along as it should, right? Teachers, you know this. If you've got to deal with a misbehaving student or someone distracting other kids, you've got to stop your lesson. You can't get on to the next thing, right? You've got to address the situation. Hey, good morning. That's how church goes as well. I believe some churches don't progress on and on because we have, and I'm one of them too, we have uh, misbehavior in our lives. I said what you should do to my kids, you should bring your teacher joy, right? Bring your teacher joy. Comply, submit, be there to help, be a helpful student. 
and then see how, what that teacher can do, and it'll be good for you. Isn't that amazing? You can see this in the, con in the context of the church, can't you? How it matters. It really does. A good teacher, a good someone with rule over others, will absolutely take that responsibility of watching for souls seriously. But then the Bible says their ability to do that is impacted by the behavior of those under them. Cause joy or cause grief. Teachers don't have, teachers who have to repeat lessons don't get to new lessons. They can't move on to other things. They can't help others. Such teachers then feel drained or such teachers, right, feel demoralized. And it's not good for the class. It's not good for churches either. That's a look at obeying them that have the rule over you. I love the audience here today because I know, I think we believe these things, but there's a whole contingent of people who don't even take 17 in any way, shape, or form. That's not me. I'm just my own guy. I follow the great shepherd, Jesus Christ. Well, your own life is worth for it. We should all plug into a local assembly, and then we should be uh, good students in those assemblies, shouldn't we? Yep. All right, we're out of time. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you'd be with us, Lord, as a church. Lord, thank you for all the blessings you give us, the honors you give us, Lord, to even be able to be impacting souls, Lord, in all the areas of our lives as parents, as church members, Lord, as teachers, as preachers. Thank you for that opportunity. Help us to never take leadership lightly, Lord. But then help us, Lord, as that principle there in, in verse 17 was talking about, Lord, help us help people who are leading um, with the way we, we um, live our lives. And I pray, Lord, as we close the book of Hebrews, pray to help us remember some of the things we learned throughout the book of Hebrews, Lord, all the talk of faith, Lord, and the, and the typologies from the Old Testament. Help us remember these things. And then, Lord, help us remember that list of things that we read in chapter 13, including the idea, Lord, that brotherly love should continue. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.